Theory as History by Jairus Banaji. This is chapter 12, which is the last chapter. Modes of production, synthesis. Marx's own sense of history was best encapsulated in the view that societies historically had assumed distinct economic forms, and that much of the history of Europe at least revolved around the differences between such forms, or modes of production, as he called them. In a broad historical perspective, the history of Europe was defined by an exuberance of economic forms, compared to what Marx saw as the monotony and stagnation of Asiatic development, or non-development. Here, Asiatic included Russia and embraced the most diverse cultural formations from the Islamic regions of the Near East to China. It was clearly a residual category, a sort of non-Europe which Marx believed, or half-believed, embodied a common economic structure where the ruling class, if one could speak of such a class, was subsumed in the state, and the mainspring of the economy lay in the tenacity of unchanging village communities. This model is usually called the Asiatic mode of production, and was a sort of default category, the most sense Marx and Engels could make of societies whose history was largely inaccessible to them. The two most general senses in which Marx uses the term mode of production are one as an epoch of production or economic formation of society, of which the best example is capitalism itself, and two as a mode of labor, labor process or form of production, that is an organization of labor based on the requirements of a given type of industry or branch of production, such as agriculture. These are different senses of the term. One can clearly more his one clearly more historically historical than the other and much broader in scope. The second less historical sense is used repeatedly by Marx in the famous excerpt from the notebooks published as results of the immediate process of production when discussing the formal subsumption of labor under capital. And it is this subordinate sense that Marx retains when he refers to the specifically capitalist mode of production, meaning by this, the real subsumption of labor into capital that is the restructuring of labor processes to generate relative surplus value, the form best adapted to the nature of capital. This sense is exemplified in passages of the following type. The subordination of the labor process to capital does not at first affect the actual mode of production, and its only practical effects are these. The worker bows to the command, the direction and supervision of the capitalist. Under formal subsumption, there is no change as yet in the mode of production itself. Technologically speaking, the labor process goes on as before. By contrast with the real subsumption of labor under capital, a complete and constantly repeated revolution takes place in the mode of production. Again, productive capital or the mode of production corresponding to capital can be present in only two forms, manufacture and large scale industry. It is in this more technological sense that Marx refers to the mode of production of guilds or to agriculture as a mode of production. Agriculture forms a mode of production sui generis or refers finally to the mode of production of small holding peasants, isolating them from one another. It is the first more purely historical meaning that is celebrated as encapsulating Marx's view of the way we should visualize the general evaluation of Europe from, from antiquity to the modern world. References dispersed across Marx's writings have generated a canonical genealogy, which sees Europe's past, more precisely the past of Western Europe, moving from, a, from slavery to feudalism to capitalism in a sort of inflexible succession, spanning whole centuries. Yet Marx himself had to emphasize the contingency of that process when he referred to his description as a historical sketch of the genesis of capitalism in Western Europe. Not the general path every people is fated to tread. Marx paid scant attention to pre-capitalist modes of production, and much of the subsequent literature on these reflects the uncertainties and formalism this engendered. How were modes of production to be understood? How much complexity should we, should we attribute to them? Could one simply read them off some register of forms of exploitation of labor? Did the feudal mode of production mean much more than the prevalence of serfdom?
How widespread was it historically? Which modes of production could best account for the evolution of societies outside Western Europe? And most crucially, because of its political implications, should Marxists see transitions to capitalism simply replicating some universal model or general sequence such as that implied in the meta-narrative of Europe's development? On the last issue, Marx's own response was emphatically negative. Marx and slavery. Marx thought that much of pre-capitalist history could be mapped out in terms of just three basic modes of production, the slave mode, the feudal mode, and the tributary, or Asiatic mode. The Asiatic mode had been called the Loch Ness monster of historical materialism because of the huge amount of controversy it generated, but the slave mode of production is no less problematic, unless all one means by it is any form of production based on the use of slave labor, an ahistorical usage. In fact, Marx avoided the term, preferring alternatives like slave system, slave economy, and so on. At the very least, a slave mode of production would have to imply a concentration of slave labor in enterprises other than households. For example, in the mass production workshops that turned out highly standardized products for the ceramic and building industries of Southern Italy in the late Republic, or even more obviously plantation slavery. But the idea that the whole of the ancient economy was characterized by these forms of production is no longer accepted today. Moreover, as Wendy Davies points out, since it is axiomatic within traditional Marxism that the slave mode gave way to the feudal mode, Marxists have to deal with the gap between the end of classical antiqu antiquity and ancient slavery, and the fully fledged serfdom which characterized the feudal mode of the, of the late Middle Ages, a gap of some six or seven hundred years. It scarcely makes sense to see a transition between modes having a longer shelf life than the mode it supersedes. In fact, closer attention to the way Marx himself handled slave production shows a considerably more sophisticated grasp of the nature of Roman slavery. In Capital, Volume 3, he writes, In the ancient world, the influence of trade and the development of commercial capital always produced the result of a slave economy, or given a different point of departure, it also meant the transformation of, pa of a patriarchal slave system oriented towards the production of the direct means of subsistence into one oriented towards the production of surplus value. It may seem odd to find the idea of surplus value coupled with the slave system, but Marx repeatedly reasoned in terms of the analogy with capitalism itself. In Capital Volume 3, he described the agrarian economies of Carthage and Rome as showing the most analogy with the capitalist rural economy. In several passages, he suggests that the investment in slave labor was a form of fixed capital. For example, in the slave system, the money capital laid out on the purchase of labor power plays the role of fixed capital in the money form and is only gradually replaced as the active life of the slave comes to an end. Or more concisely, the slave owner buys his worker in the same way as he buys his, ho his horse. If he loses his slave, he loses a piece of capital. When Marx deals with modern plantation slavery, this aspect is even more pronounced. In the plantations where production is intended for the world market, the capitalist mode of production exists, although only in a formal sense. The business in which slaves are used is conducted by capitalists. Again, the fact that we now not only call the plantation owners in America capitalists, but that they are capitalists, or finally, where the capitalist conception prevails, as on the American plantations. However one characterizes classical or Roman slavery, modern plantation slavery is certainly a form of capitalism, and one implication of this is that modes of production are more complex sorts of entities than the labor relations on which they are founded. Relations of production are not reducible to given forms of exploitation of labor. 12.1 Marxists and Feudalism a major theme to emerge from recent historiography is the persistence of slavery through late antiquity and the early Middle Ages down to about the 9th century. If the use or even widespread presence of slave labor were sufficient to, to justify talk of a slave mode of production, this would mean having to posit the existence or survival of such a mode till fairly late into the Middle Ages, an option favored by Banassi, 
who links the extinction of slavery to the agrarian expansion of the 10th century. This strand of history sees feudalism emerging from a violent and dramatic rupture in the decades around the year 1000. The general model has been extensively debated and subjected to considerable critique, but the least it establishes is that the degradation of peasant status, which we call serfdom, was a late phenomenon in Catalonia, which inspired the thesis of the feudal mutation not much earlier than the 13th century. For Marx, serfdom was a central feature of the feudal mode and peculiar to that form of society. Engels had different views, so the problem raised by a, by a belated serfdom is how we characterize the late empire and the early Middle Ages. In some general sense, there clearly was a transition from slavery to feudalism, but how, are, but how or at what level do we grasp that? The kind of bondage that defined serfdom evolved only gradually and much later, so that the mancipia of the post-Roman world were not serfs in the strict medieval sense, but a conglomeration of slaves and freed people, of whom the majority were provided with service holdings and more like farm workers than peasants. The manner in contrast was a purely Frankish innovation, a model actively propagated by the ruling classes of Frankish society and bound up with the active creation of peasant tenures. Ross Faith's monograph on the Anglo-Saxons inland is a model of how a newer Marxist historiography, historiography can tackle some of these issues, while Chris Wickham's book offers a wide-ranging basis for discussing them, even if his own theorizations are scarcely convincing, especially the view that we should identify the feudal mode with coercive rent-taking that the feudal mode was the normal economic system of the ancient and medieval periods. 12.2, the tributary mode. Against the orthodoxy of several or even many modes of production in, his, in history, John Heldon has posited the dominance of a single pre-capitalist mode of production, whose essential category was rent. However, rent in Heldon's sense subsumes tax so that there is no fundamental difference between, say, an economic regime in which the state is confronted by cohesive peasant communities, there's no significant arist aristocracy to speak of, and taxation is the main charge on peasant labor. For example, Al Andalus in Guichard's description of Valencia, and a regime in which the peasantry is dominated by a class of private landowners. Thus, feudalism and the tributary mode are variants of the same mode of production. Oh, where are we? Despite the huge differences that Marx himself saw between Western Europe and Asiatic despotism, in this version of the tributary mode, not only are major structural differences eliminated, but the organization of labor seems to lose any significance for a characterization of the economy. So that, to take the most obvious example of this, the nature of estates, the fact that the most dynamic estates of the Central Middle Ages abandoned the use of slave labor to reorganize production on the basis of domestics and labor services, ceases to have any meaning at all. Contrast the approach of historians like Verulst and Devroy, more materialist in this respect, and class relations are configured in ways that fail to convey any sense of why there has been a debate about the feudal revolution at all. On the other hand, Haldin's drive to innovate is as commendable as it is rare. For his part, Wickham having started by defining tax and rent as the bases of distinct modes of production has now veered round to the view that a single universal mode can sensibly span Asiatic type regimes such as the Ottoman and Mughal empires, and West European feudalism, except that he prefers a feudal nomenclature to Haldin's tributary one. Marx would scarcely have agreed with any of this, since he thought that the absence of private property and land in Asiatic-style regimes was a crucial difference strong enough to mark off their economic relations as substantially different historically from those prevailing in medieval, medieval Europe. The distracting feature in Marx's model is his belief in the survival of almost pristine forms of communal property, such as the Bayakara communities of North India, that were models of the kind of village communes he had in mind. <clears throat> 
This was a misreading of the British land revenue reports available to him, just as it was possible for him to misconstrue the constructed clan organization of the Scottish Highlands as the relics of a much earlier, more communal mode of, produ of production. However, if Marx's repeated assertion of the stagnation and immutability of the Oriental world has fallen out of favor, together with the Ori Orientalism that inspired it, there is still a problem about the proper Marxist characterization of Asiatic systems, Russia included, and Marx's loud thinking about Asian history contains both sound insights and flashes of brilliance. He rejected Kovalevsky's characterization of medieval India as feudal. Kovalevsky forgets, among other things, that serfdom, which represents an important element in feudalism, does not exist in India. The major category was serfdom, not rent, and as early as 1850, Marx had suggested it seems to have been the Mohammedans who first established the principle of no property in land throughout the whole of Asia. Even if this is not strictly true, it contains the important insight that the Ottomans and Mughals configured class relations around the legal fiction of the sovereign as the real owner of all the land. My own view is that it is paradoxically a recast version of the tributary mode that can help resolve the, the problem of the Asiatic mode of production, both vindicating Marx's sense of history's peculiarities and superseding his own obsolete model. As an aside, we can add that it makes no sense for the Spanish Marxists who have been at the cutting edge of these debates, Manuel Essien especially, to radicalize the differences between Islam and feudalism and endorse the view, Haldens, that feudal and tributary regimes are simply variants of the same mode of production. 12.3. Periodizing Capitalism Marx refers in the Grundries to the mercantile system as an epoch where industrial capital and hence wage labor arose in manufactures. Industrial capital has value for them, the mercantilists, because it creates mercantile capital. When, exa when exactly was that? In Capital Volume 1, the 16th century is the watershed that inaugurates the capitalist era. In the 16th century, and partly still in the 17th, the sudden expansion of trade and the creation of a new world market had an overwhelming influence on the defeat of the old mode of production and the rise of the capitalist mode. Yet Marx was willing to allow for sporadic capitalism in the Middle Ages. The clearest reference is Capital Volume 1. We come across the first sporadic traces of capitalist production as early as the 14th and 15th centuries in certain towns of the Mediterranean. Or again, and yet the modern mode. And, or again, and yet the modern mode of production in its first period, that of manufacture, developed only where the conditions for it had been created in the Middle Ages. Indeed, the distinction implied in these passages can be theorized more than it has been. Marx himself argued, at the initial stages of bourgeois production, trade dominated industry. But what were the initial stages? Rodinson grappled with the problem in Islam and capitalism, suggesting that the Muslim world of the Middle Ages had a highly developed capitalistic sector, meaning one largely dominated by merchant and financial capital. Because a specifically Marxist historiography of capitalist origins is so mesmerizingly Anglo-centric and focused on developments from the 16th century onwards, there's been no systematic attempt by Marxists anyway to map the origins of capitalism on a wider Mediterranean canvas using the hints given by Marx. Commercial partnerships, bills of exchange, transfer banking, the widespread availability of money, the growing power of the merchants guilds, and the evolution of business firms were all signs of the emergence of a substantial business economy. Um, Sombart's expression by the 13th century, which is which it seems strange not to characterize as capitalist. But of course, this was a form of capitalism dominated by moneyed capitalists, merchants and bankers above all, and drawing on traditions inherited in part from the Islamic world, where the partnership was a highly developed institution with a strong legal tradition. The analyst historian Frederick Morrow suggested that the period between the Renaissance and the French Revolution should be seen as the era of commercial capitalism, but the origins of this epoch go much further back, even if, like all origins, they are impossible to pin down with any precision. 
What can be argued with some plausibility is that the initial stages that Marx referred to straddled a long history from at least the 12th century to the late 18th. The powerful rivalries of the age of company capitalism were completely different in character from the banking and commercial capitalism of the 13th and 14th centuries. Portuguese expansion, driven by the commercial bourgeoisie and backed by the monarchy, marks off the 15th century as the true watershed. It was this phase that ended in the decline of Dutch commercial supremacy and the subordination of commercial to industrial capital, as Marx put it. Commercial capitalism spawned the slavery of the Americas. The plantations were capitalist creations par excellence. The Dutch merchant capitalism, which Marx saw dominating the 17th century, was a capitalism founded in large measure on sugar. But long before that, and indeed throughout the era of commercial capitalism, capital extended its sway over whole sectors of production in ironwork, textiles, shipbuilding, and the cottage industries through the Verlag system. In short, the theoretical distinction we need here is one between capitalism in this more general sense, a sense which allows for the commercial capitalism of the 12th to 18th centuries and what Marx himself called the capitalist mode of production. The latter is only a historically developed form of capitalism in the more general sense, which in this way acquires a wider purchase and helps resolve problems that continue to mystify Marxists. The model here is one of combined development rather than the linear succession between modes of production familiar from the transition debates. The initial stages, as Marx called them, threw up distinct configurations of capitalism from the foundries of northern Kiangsu in the 11th century, or the capitalist groups who dominated the economy of Venice in the 13th to the massive syndicates that controlled the Glasgow tobacco trade in the 18th. The slave plantations of the 17th century and later were one configuration within this general landscape. Capitalist enterprises, but not quite of the form that Marx would see as typical of the specifically capitalist mode of production, that is, industrial capitalism. 12.4. Articulation? Whatever one thinks of the distinction just proposed, there is the separate issue of how capitalist production can integrate diverse forms of exploitation and ways of organizing labor in its drive to produce surplus value. This is particularly clear in agriculture, where it often accounts for an integration of household labor into capitalism. The use of sharecropping and labor tenancy on capitalist farms in the late 19th, early 20th centuries is a striking example of a capitalism based on family labor systems. The literature on agrarian capitalism displays an impressive variegation of labor systems and general ways of controlling and exploiting living labor that capitalist landowners deployed according to the special requirements of different crops, landscapes, and labor processes. Indeed, agrarian studies is one area where Marxists or Marx-influenced scholars have turned out superlative work, which includes the rich South African debate in which Tim Keegan and Helen Bradford were major contributors. The upshot of all this work is that relations of production are not reducible to forms of exploitation of labor, since capitalist relations of production are compatible with a wide variety of forms of labor, from chattel slavery, sharecropping, or the domination of casual labor markets, to the coerced wage labor peculiar to colonial regimes, and of course, free wage labor. Indeed, the widespread use under fascism of forced labor in large industrial concerns, such as Daimler Benz, shows how simplistic it is to read relations of production off some imagined register of labor types. To construe the ways labor is exploited and controlled as distinct relations and therefore modes of production is to end with a model that sees the capitalist world economy as structured by an articulation of different modes of production, usually, usually feudalism. But historical materialism needs to move beyond this motionless paradigm to a construction of the more complex ways capitalism works. In fact, the huge commercial expansion of the 19th century very largely involved an integration of peasant agriculture into industrial capitalism, which in turn spurred the expansion of more local systems of commercial capitalism and a widespread dispossession of the peasantry. Thus, what the world economy of the 19th century threw up was an articulation of forms of capitalism more than a combination of modes of production.
in other words, economic changes driven by the gigantic expansion of industry and the rapid growth in demand for cotton, tobacco, silk, indigo, and so on. The gravitational pull of European and American industry wrought changes in the distant countrysides. They drew on through local traje trajectories of accumulation and dispossession. The prehistories of a more fully developed capitalism and the struggles bound up with primitive accumulation were only ways in which capitalist world trade in Marx's expression destroyed and dissolved all earlier forms of production, revolutionizing the entire economic structure of society the world over.